Good evening from the UK and welcome to Open Minds Chat Show. I have a very, very special guest with me this evening and hopefully we'll, we'll get through the conversation about giggling. Because last time um, we had a conversation, we, we laughed most of the way through, which is always good. Before I introduce my guest, um, I'm going to read off my auto cue as I do. So this week's special guest is Gail, I can't say your surname, Heysan? Heysan. Heysan, there we go, Heysan. Gail has had paranormal experiences since she was a teenager. Gail attended the Woodstock Music Festival in 1969, appears in the Woodstock documentary, and is featured in the recent book, 50 Years of Peace and Music. Today in the research community, Gail is known as a telepath, psychic and remote viewer, and someone who accurately sees distant or future events. The chapter on the chapter on telepathy in Dr. Dean Radings, and he's amazing, international bestseller, Supernormal, describes one of many successful paranormal experiments with Gail as the subject. She has also contributed to many experiments and papers on paranormal phenomena. In the 1970s, entrepreneur Werner Erdhart, Erdhart presented Gail at events to promote the mind dy dynamic seminars that evolved into uh, seminars training on ESD. God, this is really pushing my vocabulary. Gail <laughs> has been welcomed into in indigenous cultures, including, I cannot say it, Gail, Hokal Rachel, Rachel. Okay, of Mexico and the Haida, Haida of Alaska and I can say, and the shamans of Mongolia. In 2012, she was initiated as a Mongolian Burat Buryat. shaman. In 2014, she was awarded an honorary doctorate from Mongolia's, Mongolia's National Academy of Sciences. For decades, Gail has been a subject and contributor to scientists in the paranormal and sci research field. She has led an unconventional life, yes, and found herself accepted into other cultures by just being herself. Right, can I have a break now? And after reading that out, um, Gail, welcome, you wonderful, wonderful being, to Open Minds. Well, thank you for having me. When I, when I hear you read those things, I say, who is that person? <laughs> Well, I don't think, uh, give me a year, I don't think I'll ever have you back after a year, because you're more likely going to have an, a longer bio with all your <laughs> achievements. Now, also, Gail, what is not on there, which is your most recent in my um, uh, description in your bio, is you are a podcast host, are you not? Yes, September 1st, uh, I launched a small, medium at large podcast with Gail Heisen. And uh, I have to say, I never imagined what's happened in the last two and a half months yes. on this little podcast and, yes. and what it's brought to me. And I've also been on these different shows. In fact, I just received a gift. I was on this wonderful show. It was my first show because I'm being a guest like on your shows. Yes. And um, it was Bigfoot and the Bunny. And they just sent me, they wanted to send me something that represented a small medium at large, because that's my, my title. And it's also title of a manuscript I have. But so they sent me this Macheshka doll that has a little blonde hair and goes off from big to small. And sm oh, <laughs> that's lovely. The funny part about it was, I, I have a collection of these. I've been collecting them for years and these people wow. didn't know this. So I just want to say a shout out. People should check out Bigfoot and the Bunny. What a wonderful right, couple. We shout it out on my show for them because yes. I love Gail. And if and if, if I love Gail and you love Gail, then you're friends with me. Um, Gail, I mean, I have watched a podcast um, in between running my three platforms. I do find the time and I go in and you know how I feel about your podcast. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely okay. amazing. You are natural. Um, you're like me, you've got the gift of the gab, and you can chat for England. That's what we do. We chat for England. 
that's all you need is a gift, gift of the gab and chat for, oh, sorry, chat for the USA, I should yeah. say. And the funny thing about it was when I was told to do this because you need to have a social media platform when you approach a publisher with your book now. So uh, the publisher said, don't, don't come back to us until you have a social media platform. So I said, oh my God, what should, I, what should I be able to do this? And I never imagined that, like it doesn't even matter to me now what happens. I love doing the podcast. Same here. If, Set. if it launches me a publisher, great. If it doesn't, great. The fact is that I'm reaching people like you and others all around the world yeah. that I feel like I'm having all these new friends. And I know, I know. It's a wonderful experience. Yeah. And I didn't know how, you know, I would imagine people didn't want to really hear anything I had to say, yeah. but it turns out they actually are finding, you know, mm -hmm. some kind of camaraderie or common knowledge that we all have. And it's yeah. because, of, you know, my idea was that I would share stories that heal. Yeah. Because I think one of the things about life right now is it's so important for us to share with each other what's going on. It's not mainstream yeah. media. It's not what other people are telling us. No. It's sharing what really happens Absolutely. for us. Absolutely. And there's a, there's a secondary part, which is, I know it's part of your podcast, as it is with my show, Open Minds and the podcast, Inception, is to inspire others and to allow a space where they can share their story or hear another with a similar story um, that is okay. And I've also found through podcasts, um, especially between me and you, when we did the deep dive off camera, the same things, similar experiences, the same connections. And now it's I'm finding that with others and it's like, oh my God, I'm That's cloned it. and they're cloned. Hey. Yeah. And when I, I was listening to a, one of those shows and it was someone talking about people who see the white uh, lady, you know, yeah. after yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. An apparition that's walking around. Yeah. And I'm listening to the story and I hear this story that I'd never heard before, which was that in the olden days, when a, a woman died, she was usually buried in her wedding gown, which would have normally been white. Yeah. And I thought, what a great, I'd never even heard the story, whether it was, you know, happened for years or not, but it made so much sense that why would people in other countries all seem the same white lady? What was with the white lady? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now where do you hear that kind of stuff? You don't hear that on any show. It's really, it's, yeah. it's other important stories that it's really wonderful. and. I have to say, I'm, I'm listening to another one and she was saying how she had this whole experience when she had cervical cancer. And I'm thinking, oh, when I had such an experience with cervical cancer, yeah. So yeah. like, yeah, you feel comfort when you hear yeah. your words come out of another yeah. person. And it is, you know, as I said, it, it's, you know, we will get into her journey one second, but this is me and Gail. We get together. We're not, it's going to be organic. Um, and I listen to, you know, my guests come on or I appear on other shows and and even the questions they ask, they say, well, I've experienced this. I'm going, to, so have I. Wow, who would have thought? I've spent like most of the lifetime, maybe one or two people very similar, but nothing like what the podcasts have opened up to all of us and seemingly bringing us all together. Now, on that note, we are going to get down and not get serious. So here we go. Are you ready? Yes. So, I'm going to be slightly professional here now, girl, with my English voice. Okay, hey, I'll be with my New York straight. accent. <laughs> yes, with your American accent, which I can't tell where you come from, your dialect. New York. It's a your New York accent. Oh, that's why. Oh, that's why you sound very similar. I interviewed and I was on Rob Yop's show. Um, and I, as soon as I heard his accent, I said, oh, when I first met him and I went, you sound like a gangster. And I remember <laughs> James Cagney, you know, old British films way back. And he went, that's because I'm from New York. And, and funny thing is, remember when we first met, we digressed again, this is me and Gail. Um, I said, were you Jewish or something? Do you remember? Because yeah. the accent, so now I'm getting that accent. I never looked at Rob as Jewish, but he could be old or not. Exactly. Now I'm uh, the accent. Jewish New Yorker who also had gangster uh, family. Yes. <laughs> in. Right, I've got a gangster on the show. She is a 
Trust me. Right, no, we, not really, not really, just a little here and there. <laughs> well, we've all done that. Um, not me, I'm an angel. Anyway, let's <laughs> let's get serious. Right, are we ready or not? Uh, yes. We're not going to get serious, but we're going to start. So where did this wonderful journey, I, I read some of your bio, um, where did this journey, your spiritual journey, Gail, where did it begin for you, this road? I, I don't, I can't, it's hard for me to think of it as any place that I actually, you know, intentionally began. Mm -hmm. It's more like it just took me on a, on a yeah. ride. Go for it. Yeah. And, um, I was a sensitive child when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember my dad taking me, my dad was an unconventional guy. And back then he was involved in the Theosophical Society. And this is, you know, the, the 50s, the mid 50s, yeah. early 60s. And he later got involved in the vegan uh, movement. And we went and lived in a vegan commune in Southern California. And we were exposed to alternative healing and alternative ways of lifestyles of living that were not common then, but now everybody's doing them. But back then it was considered weird yeah. or odd, yeah. unusual enough that we were written up in the daily news in New York when we left to come uh, cross country because we left in a Frankfurter truck, um, mm -hmm. an old ambulance and a 1955 Cadillac and we caravaned across country to go live in this commune in Southern California in uh, Escondido. And I think that the people that my dad was involved with that we were meeting as kids when we would go to their houses and things, I think those <coughs> things were stimulating something because, you know, just at the vegan commune alone, we would have people come in and talk about, you know, garlic and all the healing of garlic and how if you do all these things with garlic, you're gonna have a healthier body, which by the way, I do believe in garlic. And then we- So do I, so do I. <laughs> but not when you're not don't eat it when you're about to kiss somebody is no it? no that would be the <laughs> so no, no. Then we had um we were not given um uh, medication medicines or seen doctors mm. or dentists growing up mm. so we were if we were sick which wasn't that often but if we did get a flu or a cold or a fever uh, we were never given an aspirin we were put on water and fasted mm -hmm. and um I saw amazing healings that went on during that time. My dad was in, a, in, a, in a, a very bad car accident trying to teach our Hindu monk how to drive because he was part of the commune. And it was a real commune, not like, uh, like a drug hippie kind of commune yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Actual functioning commune yeah. where certain, certain persons was the mother and someone else was managing the house and someone yeah. else was working and everybody participated. Yeah. And so they felt that he needed to learn to drive because then he could do more things to help around in the commune. Mm -hmm. But while driving, he heard Yogananda call him and he let go of the wheel. Oh. And him and my father were all pretty much nearly killed. Yeah. And um, he was healed in the basement of the house we lived in, in the commune. He was put on water. He was removed from the hospital immediately and only bandaged up and not, he did not receive any medications. And he healed in six weeks with color therapy, wow. which I believe was legal in England and other places in Europe, but it's illegal here. And the, wow. the, the man that we lived with, Jay Dinshaw, who was the president of the vegans, he, um, his father had built those color therapy machines. Yeah. It was illegal. So he went to prison for that, but we happened to have one of the machines where we, in our commune. Yeah. So yeah. that was used on my dad to heal him. And they just used different color light with, they just put a piece of colored glass in front of this big wood box that would have these light bulbs inside. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. this would be put on him to like, when he'd be in incredible pain, because his ribs had been uh, broken and well, anyways, he was a mess. The uh, red light would give him relief from the pain. Mm -hmm. And I watched as a seven year old sitting at the edge of his bed every day in darkness, watching him heal and be able to be a mechanic and work under cars in six weeks after such yeah, a that, I mean that, I mean, you know, for um, a young child like that, I mean, everything is mystical and magical and we don't have the biases and the belief systems and or even the the really you know demanding analytical i need to find out the truth mind so for a child of that age it must be wow 
and you must you it just resonated because you didn't have the belief systems yet or any you know the the sort of analytical mind to question it or or this couldn't be or possibly and you need to go to hospital so that really must have impacted you well that consciousness. that and i'm just saying all those little things when we would go to these places my father would say to me my friends keep telling me you're such a spiritual child. So I don't know what that means and why yeah. adults would say I was a spiritual child, but that's what they would say to him in these yeah. little groups when we would go to them. So we had another guest that him and his wife, when they came, they became my parents' friends for lifelong. They didn't live in the same state that we lived in, but when they, they lived in California back then, and then my mother always kept up with them until they passed on many years later but it was Dottie and Al Haley. And I mean, I remember these people's names mm -hmm. because he had shown me a picture of a flying saucer and had told me that, and this is 1962, and he had told me that he had gone off on this ship. And, you know, as a little child, you're listening to this and he said, yeah, yeah I went off and I did these things and happened in my yard here and all that. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I'm not... I'm not saying that I believe in this or not believe in this. I'm just saying these are the things I was exposed to at a very young age. Yes, yes. And um, I think that uh, things like this kind of a situations like this was very eye opening. Watching yoga, uh, yeah. meditation, mm. all this in 1962, 63. Mm. My dad was growing wheatgrass then, and everybody drinking wheatgrass juice, and we had to all you know drink fresh carrot juice every day, and yeah. it was. It's a lifestyle like people live, you know, years later when they say to me, oh, yes, have you had wheatgrass? You know, like, yeah, I said I had it. I don't want any more. <laughs> no, I don't blame you. No, I don't blame you. However, you've got to look at um, for young children. And we all know that through child development now, um, what the child is, the social determinants around a young child. That was part of my career before um, influences the um, personality and the traits of that individual child so you know you you were in an environment around you of um such frequencies and energies and open-mindedness so you know you've got the healing um hey look um that's a ufo you wouldn't question that as a child because you're in that environment so i i i mean it's coming from me i'd say i would say you were as a child already open-minded and no doubt why you would be called a spiritual child because when may, your peers or adults spoke to you you would have been engaged in the conversation and resonated with it because that was your environment i mean hello you didn't have you know in school you will believe this you can't say that so it's quite understandable that you turned out the way you did <laughs> <laughs> they used to say it when i was seven sometimes they'd say it's like she's 20 you know <laughs> Yeah, I can Everybody understand. Thought I was older. Now I am older. <laughs> yeah, now you are. Well, you're not much older than I, so there you go. And I'm thinking, how old was I when she? And I was three when you were doing all that stuff. I was mm -hmm. three. I was I was a bubba still. Um, but yeah, do go on. So we're oh. moving along. What comes now, next? So then, uh, so that was a, a, a first basis of yeah. an unusual childhood growing yes. up. Yeah. My father didn't believe in education so he always encouraged us not to go to school yeah. because he felt it was a brainwashing institution so I ended up going to school and you know being in the special progress and the gifted program and I'd come home with these report cards that said I was uh, very very high reading abilities and my dad would go eh who cares about that you know <laughs> so I um uh spent my time in in high school it lasted about a month i think i'm not sure and my dad my dad was out here living in we had all returned back to new york after living in mexico and florida and so we were he was always in search of the newest health and yeah yeah you know, and and place of that and um he was always at places before they became popular and 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 become very expensive places to live at yeah. had my dad bought property in any of these places it would he would have left us a legacy of real estate wealth <laughs> but he didn't he just <laughs> he would just get it yeah yeah and then the next thing next 10 years later would be the booming place that everybody yeah, yeah, yeah. Go to. He was always ahead of his time in fact if 
if he had been born in my generation, then the things that he did would have been more acceptable. Yeah. But from coming from his generation, it was not. It was considered wild and crazy. Yeah. Okay. So as a teenager, I dropped out of high school and I, and I came with my boyfriend who um, was dodging uh, the Vietnam War and the draft at the time. Mm -hmm. And we both left New York on our first flight ever on a plane and came out to California to be with my dad who was living in a pickup truck trying to find the new, the new cause he had always loved California from that mm -hmm. first time. So he was looking for the new place to settle which ended up us being up here in Northern California. But before doing that, we went with him to communes and we, we met, you know, the Sun Bear tribe and Rolling Thunder and all these different Native American people and all these different self-help groups were very big then in the early 70s here. So there was one particular one uh, called Mind Dynamics that had this man who was quite famous because he made millions and millions of dollars doing this, uh, Werner Earhart, who later then formed something called EST and then, which was called Earhart Seminar Training. And then after that, it became the forum. And I hear there's all these other new ones that have sprung from this thing. And uh, when I'd, we'd gone to a lecture about it, I heard this, this, this um, woman say, oh, I can tell you the name and the age of someone and they will tell you everything that's physically wrong with that person and the city that they live in. That's all we need to be told. And I was like, how could anybody do that? And we went into a lecture and sure enough, you filled out a card, it was given to the woman and in a matter of minutes, she would tell you everything about that person and what their illnesses were. So I really wanted to go to that kind of a class because it involved healing. Yeah. And I was very, even though as a teenager, it's an unusual, besides being a big rock and roller and loving being at Woodstock in the center 10th row of the, of the yeah. concert uh, and seeing, you know, all my favorite Jimi Hendrix, everybody through the years, I um, I also felt this feeling about like massaging or healing, or there was something in me that felt like I always wanted to do something to help other yeah. people if I could. Yeah. And so that was when I said to my dad, would you pay for me to take this course? Mm -hmm. And my dad is a very frugal guy. I, I always tell everyone he reused dental floss. Yeah. So that's how frugal he was. Mm -hmm. And he didn't have a lot of money. He was, you know, he was a car mechanic. And back then car mechanics didn't make the money like they mm -hmm. do now. And he um, went and listened to the lecture and saw the same demonstration and said, oh my God, we have to do this. Mm -hmm. So he said, I'll do it first because it's $150. And he said, and if I think it's good, I'll pay for you to go. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the course, he signed me up immediately for the next class. Mm -hmm. And when I took the class, I was able to do all the things they were teaching that was supposed to happen at the end in the second yeah. weekend. Yeah. But I was able to start seeing yeah. these things and I learned these different techniques that at 15 and a half years old, mm -hmm. nobody was telling you about sleep mm -hmm. techniques and how to get rid of headaches. And yeah. they were all different, you know, mental type exercises to do that kind of work on yourself or to do healing to help others. Yeah. So I started um, in the beginning, all I could see when I would like scan a body, mm -hmm. all I would be drawn to would be say like a color or an area of the body. But as I started to do more and more of them, I became so sharp at it that they asked me to do volunteer work, mm -hmm. being the person that would be the one showing other people that, hey, for signing up for this course, you can do this. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. My friend Russell says it was like I was a shill, you know, out yeah. there, which I didn't know. And I was thinking I was really doing good, which yeah. is what my intention was. And I started to be given cases. They called them cases. I would be given ones that nobody could do in these groups. Mm -hmm. And they discovered I was able to do them where other people would find difficulty and they couldn't find the illness, they couldn't find the information. So I started doing hundreds of them. And at night I would come home and I would work on the person again and I'd cover them in gold light or I would try to cleanse out their liver or mind you, I had been raised with no medical or medical, you know, or the names of diseases or any of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would just, I'd pull up the names of the disease. I got so good at it that I could shake a vial of blood in my workshop, in my mind, mm -hmm. and tell them what pharmaceutical drugs the persons were taking for their illness, mm -hmm. which I would have had no idea. Yeah. 
Yeah. And the only thing I'd ever heard of was aspirins or whatever. I mean, I had no idea about these names of medical drugs. Yeah. So I had two experiences I learned with it, which was I thought, am I reading people's minds? Is it that because the person's in the audience who knows this sick person mm -hmm. and I'm telling them what's wrong with them by just being told their name, their age and their city, maybe I'm, maybe I'm picking up their thoughts is yeah. what I was yeah. thinking. Maybe I'm not really attaching on to the person yeah. or meeting that person. Yeah. And then because I was doing this so much, all my friends were saying, oh, well, could you do it for me? And oh, could you do it yeah. for me? You know? <laughs> and so I was doing these things and I went to visit New York. I went to visit my, my old girlfriends who were still friends to this day since we're five years old. And um, it was my friend Esther. I said, well let, well, let me do a case on your mother. So I do the case on the mother and I pick out the different things and they're correct. And then I come up with, I think it was her leg was broken. Is a leg or an arm? It's a long time ago to remember. I think it was the leg. And she said, my mother's leg was never broken. So she goes back and she tells the mother, Gail did this thing. You know, the mother thinks Gail's, oh, yeah, yeah, you're ready, you know. <laughs> and she said that you had a broken leg once. And she said, I did. When I was younger, before I ever had children, I'd broken my leg. And that was when I realized I was not getting the information from reading the person's mind. No. I was truly getting the information from the actual person who I was yeah. connecting to. Yeah. So that opened a whole world for me of knowing that I could do and see things away from my own, because I started to do it long distance also. And I could see I could do these things, whether the person was there or not there. Yeah. Yeah. And I was in this, you know, doing it all volunteer for them. And so I did it in hotels in front of hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. And I seem to have, I don't have performance anxiety. I seem to, when it comes to performing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, I seem yeah. to do better yeah. than that. Yeah. I must love the attention. I know, same here. I love it. I love it. <laughs> gotta be, gotta be. So, and before I'm always nervous, can I do the thing? And then it all happens, you know? Way to go. So I had a terribly frightening experience. Mm -hmm. And mind you now, I've been doing it for a year and a half. So I'm almost 17. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing, I've been doing a lot of very sick, nearly dying pe people. Mm -hmm. And I all of a sudden feel over my left shoulder like a presence and I feel it following me everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I start to get scared inside that there's something, you know, I'd heard about possessions and exorcisms, but I'd never had any kind of experience or thought that I'd ever have to deal with something negative like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, and I'm a teenager. So, you know, I'm also going to my rock concerts in between here, right? So I'm living in San Francisco with my boyfriend and the two of us have an apartment and we're out of the truck from living with my dad. Mm -hmm. And um, I start to get to a point where I'm afraid to go to the bathroom by myself or be alone because I think this thing is going to just possess me. Mm -hmm. And it feels like a dark mass. Yeah. So I call up Werner Earhart and they, he has no time to talk to me. And I'm thinking, my God, I volunteered for you for almost two years and you can't even give me a little bit of your time. Mm -hmm. It just was not with compassion. Yeah. And they said, the thing they said was you create your own reality. So now deal with it. Well, they didn't teach you about protecting yourself in those days. You know, this was a new field where yeah. they were taking good information from, you know, L. Ron Hubbard stuff, the Rosicrucian and, you know, all these different, mm -hmm. they, were, they were pulling from all the things to yeah. make their little self-help yeah. thing. Not teaching you how to protect yourself, not teaching you that you need to yeah. go into this in, from a solid place, which yeah. all your listeners must, of course, know that. Yeah. But then it wasn't taught. Yeah. So... I told my dad, who was in Northern California, and I was back in San Francisco, and he said, you have to go and face whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Just tell the, the, the thing or the human or the person, whatever it is, that form, tell it that they cannot inhabit you mm -hmm. and you are strong and they cannot enter your body. Mm -hmm. So I, I went to what I thought was sleep, but did not feel like sleep. Mm -hmm. And I faced this thing that it was a dreamlike state, but I had all my senses in it. I could taste, I could smell, yeah. I could touch, I could hear, everything was there. And 
I have this weird kind of experience where I see this person in the distance and I realize that he's one of the cases I've been working on who's dying mm -hmm. and he seems to want to attach on to my life force energy. Mm -hmm. And this is a lot to figure out when you might got to keep going. Yeah, I know the feeling. Yeah. And so I, um, I said, you cannot be part of this. You have to go away from me. Mm -hmm. And I looked down at my arms and little holes like opened up in each side of my arms and blood started coming down each arm. And all of a sudden I felt like there was a liver in my mouth and I could smell meat and flesh and blood. And I said, you have to go, you have to go, you have to go. This is my body and my place and you cannot be part of it. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I know, there was like a electrical charge in the room that was like zzz, like that and, and everything just dissipated. Yeah. And I could just feel all of the darkness left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was exhausted, but everything was gone. Mm -hmm. And that was the day that I decided I would never do anything psychic or mm -hmm. anything like that ever again because of that experience. Yeah. So instead, I just lived with all my regular dreams of the future, yeah. knowing things about people, yeah. having moments in places where I could tell something scary had happened there. Just all of my regular stuff, yeah. I just yeah. let be natural. Yeah. But I never, you know, people say, oh, you, I said, no, I don't do cases anymore. I don't do yeah. any of those things. I don't do readings. I just, whatever's natural, I allow. And when it comes, it's always a surprise. And I'm yeah. always thankful for the information. Yeah. yeah. Then it comes 1998. So it's been more than 40, I don't know, 35 years or so, a long time. Yeah. I had stopped doing that. I stopped, I think, in 73 or 74. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do it again until 1998 when I happened upon an invitation from my husband's uh, work where they were looking for uh, people to participate in something called the Phenom Project. Mm -hmm. And my husband worked for uh, Paul Allen, who was one of the richest men in the world at the time. And he had, uh, you know, when it was just like they talk about in Silicon Valley with the most amazing parties and yeah, yeah, things. Yeah offices and they buy them the most incredible chairs to sit in you know it's everything like you thought it was the height of Silicon Valley and a couple doors down from my husband's office Dr. Dean Radin and Russell Targ were sharing an office to do this run this phenom project that was funded by this Paul Allen mm -hmm. and so my husband received a message saying they're looking for people in the company to be subjects they need for their experiments mm -hmm. So my husband told them what kind of type I was that I dream things and then it happens right after I tell them about the dream. Mm -hmm. Would you be interested in someone like her? And they said, could she write down her stories and then come in for an interview? Mm -hmm. So my niece Valerie sat at the computer and I just kept spewing out stories because once I start on stories, it leads to another story yeah. and another yeah. story. Yeah. And you know, we can go on and on. Yeah. yeah. And uh, she writes it all down and we have 10 pages of stories and I go and bring it into this meeting at the interval research. And I meet these two famous men and they've both just finished new books that they had just had published. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to be an hour interview, but of course, because more stories kept coming besides the ones that I'd written down, I was there for two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. And at the end, they each took me to the side separately and said, you know, you should write a book. Mm -hmm. You should write a book. And then here's a copy of our book my book, you know, the book that they had written, and we would love to work with you. So from 1998, I said, you know, this is different. They're not selling anything. No. They're not using me as a shill. No. They're not trying to take advantage of me. They're just studying this phenomena. Yeah. yeah. This is, seems like a good, safe thing to do. I will go back into this. Yeah. I've always wondered, had I stayed doing the kind of techniques I'd learned in mind dynamics and continued on what I would be like, because when I was doing it intensively, then my psychics or intuitive self was so sharp. I would always know before the phone rang, before the people came. Before, yeah. Yeah. At times it was almost annoying that so much would be flooding at you. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I can't be that because I didn't do those all the years. I just went with the natural. Yeah. And so I did not know the kind of things I was capable of doing until they would sit me in front of a screen or hook me up to a bunch of physiological yeah. machinery that I was able to do the different tasks that they'd asked me to I've, do. I've seen the, the picture you recently put up with all the probes on your head. I, you oh, look, yeah. You look very sexy, darling. I that see, is 
Yes, very sexy, darling. Yeah. I'd actually experienced that way back when I was a child, having all of them on my head. And uh, I felt like an alien and things were coming out of my head. But I was a small child when I experienced that. So, but do go on. So what, what were you doing that for then? Were you doing... Um, it was what, um, that's a different story. It was what, what was being done for me. My, my psychic abilities were being tested by others. Oh, so back when you were a child. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, oh, very. Oh, we don't, we have so much in common. <laughs> we, we do, we do, do. But that, that didn't come up in the, la the last conversation we had because I only recently saw the picture this week in the last few days you put up a memory and I went, oh yeah, that happened to me when I was in the computers and there wasn't even any computers back in the day when I was a child, but there was computers when I was a child. So yeah, it, I do understand, yeah, but do go on. I mean, you do know from our previous conversations, I'm a massive admirer of Dean Radin um, for the work and his contribution as he, a scientist, yeah. the, well, amazing. <laughs> Um, but I don't want to hold you up because we've got so much more to go into. So you well, and your listeners, there are many books written by Dean Radin. He's amazing. And He's check amazing. them all out. In fact, there many of them have been translated into eight or nine different languages, yeah. and they're all over the world. And he is an amazing, he's a very he's been, humble he's been, guy. I've got to say, it, we've digressed. We will do this, me and Gail. He's been in all the documentaries that I need to listen to um, about the phenomena or the quantum physics, which I studied, everything. I mean, I have been friends with him on Facebook. For, I don't know how many donkeys he is. Um, and I've never, I have such the highest regard for the work he does. I, you know, I like posts, but I never, never said message and I thought, oh my God, no. Because to me, he's, he's a peer. But he's a very humble, humble scientist. Does that make sense to you? He's a very humble scientist, and he has an incredibly great sense of humor. Yeah. yeah. So he's he, and he's a joy to ever you know. Whenever he lectures, his yeah. talks are always very entertaining, and they and they reach out to you know all different all varieties. different all different um you know. Look, we digress. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. We okay. Do. Okay. Let's get back onto the track. Okay, so that was when I met Dean and uh, Russell, and I started finding out that I could do things like uh, remote viewing, which I had never been trained to do, but that was my first task with them after they checked me with certain electrodes about yeah. things to see how my body physiology, physi I can't say that word either, physiology. but how my body would react. Yeah. The, I'd like to say a couple of the experiments, if that would be okay. Yeah. Uh, one of them was, um, it was where, whether your body, this has nothing to do with your mind or your mm -hmm. intuition, does your body sense danger before it's coming? Mm -hmm. And it's, it was explained to me, I often don't understand the science behind the things. I just want to know what the task is. You know, let mm -hmm. me do, I want to do the best I can for Dean or Russell whenever I do anything for them. So once I understand the task, then, okay, so we go on and he says, we're going to be showing you photos at very fast rates. Like, I don't know, a few seconds and the next photo comes and the next photo, they're, they're pretty fast. I don't know, it's 15 seconds or whatever it is. And it's a collection of photos and randomly the computer will decide when to throw in a scary photo. Yeah. Back then in the beginning, we were used, they were using scary photos. Yeah. yeah. And um, some of them I ended up taking home with me and I said, I don't know if it's good for me to do so much scary photos. Um, it would be like real car accident victims where, yeah. you know, the eyeball is hanging over here, you know, yeah. it's pretty yeah. scary looking things yeah. to see. And then the body would have an alarm that kind of sets off. It has something to do with some part of the back of the brain. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think it was described as if you were a caveman, you would know the saber toothed tiger was coming because yeah. of that part of the brain. Yeah. So my brain was able to sense danger before the, yes. that picture come up yes. so these that was one thing that they would test then they would test how my heart rate and my sweat when I was sweating from my fingers mm -hmm. how that would change during these kind of experiments then we moved into I did so many different ones but we moved into the remote viewing mm -hmm. and I've not been trained as a remote viewer I was just told to sit with Russell because that's who I did all my remote viewing with and um, we would do these 20, um, 
20 trial sessions mm -hmm. and it would be once a week, excuse me, and we would do two sessions, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And that's how our friendship began because in the afternoon we'd have to have lunch. So Russell and I would have lunch together and I would tell him stories about my life and he would tell me stories about his life. And now we've been friends, you know, we're very close. Oh, and um, I love him very dearly. Um, in fact, my son, my, my husband has made two apps for him oh. on remote viewing, which we can talk about after. Yeah. So uh, all I did was lay down on the floor because I always like laying down and closing my eyes when I'm doing this, if I can. Now I do it sitting up, etc. Yeah. But uh, Russell would tell me uh, there's going to be a picture selected. And this was the first time I did this kind of precognitive remote viewing. <laughs> Yeah, different than location viewing, which I yeah. did years later, yeah. and is actually in the film in his film. Mm -hmm. um, the the um, remote viewing would be at one o'clock. I would be given a pencil and a piece of paper, mm -hmm. and Russell would just encourage me. He's the most incredible uh, monitor or guide or whatever the word is for someone taking you on a remote viewing. And he'd say, just, you know, look around, show me what, tell me what you see. Don't, don't just, just draw the, the shapes and, 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 and what you, what you're getting. So I drew for them. And then at three o'clock, a picture would come up and then it would be judged whether my drawings would match the picture that the computer had picked. Mm -hmm. So this is a double blind experiment. Yeah. Nobody knows what the picture is. Yeah. It's coming out of 300 photos of yeah. National Geographic places. And sure enough, I was able to draw elements and things inside the yep. picture that would come up. I, Russell said I had I paid I had a very good attention to detail, little details I would pick up. Mm -hmm. And I've always find color seems very strong for me, yeah. knowing colors yeah. in things. But also for me, it's a, a feeling. Yeah. Because that's how they they pick some of these photos when they're doing this type is they they have sort of emotional. Yeah, they're uh, very emotive. They're emotive. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So yes. that makes me attracted to, to be able yes. to remote yes. view it. So I didn't know then that I could do that. And so all of a sudden I was a remote viewer, you know. There you go. There you go. I mean, we're gonna have to come away from Dean and Russell for because I we will we will be here till tomorrow morning. There's so much. I want to um move you slightly ahead of after the um you did the experiments with them, um, because I know you're going to come in with that. Hold on, hold on. Okay. When you found these, um, I mean, this opened you up. I mean, we've already spoke about your childhood and it was just how that went. But when you found there was more to you and more to you, you could do this. And, oh, it was natural. I haven't been trained. It was not. I mean, at that point, before we move on slightly, what? where were you at? What? I mean, you were still, you know, you weren't old. You were still what in your mid to thirties, or what? When we? How well, old were you? Actually, I was when I met Dean and Russell. I was, let's see, my door. I was, I was breastfeeding. <laughs> oh, wow, there you go. Because <laughs> I, I breastfed my children till they were two years yeah. old. Well, I have three children, and it was my last child because I would take her with me <coughs> to interval research. Yeah. yeah. So how and, old were you? Uh, I was, I think I was. 41. Right. So at 40. I gave birth to her when I was 41. So, so, so and she was like six months old. So I was, in, I was 41, 42. That's yeah. when we started. I gave, my last 60. giving birth, I gave birth, my last one was at 42, believe it or not. Oh, see? <laughs> yeah, I know. The last one was, I was 42. I was 42, my last pregnancy. Yeah. Anyway, we've done it again. Oh, okay. So, so we'll go back to, you know, we'll have to have our how social did, call. Yeah. After. We'll go another story. How did I that... wanted to, Before I leave this, I just wanted to give something okay. for your listeners because I think it's important for them to know that when we talk about remote viewing, mm -hmm. that if they're interested, there's two downloads they can get either on their Apple. Yeah. I'm not sure. I know the, um, I'm not sure if you can get it on the Android, the ESP trainer. Mm -hmm. which is Russell Targ's trainer that they were using to help train the military that he asked my husband, who's a computer yeah, scientist. You have to advertise this. because she's So I would suggest, husband. yes, but ESP trainer is yeah. 
four photo, four colors, and you pick yeah. which one you think. That, it's a very good exercise. Yeah. And then they just released a new one because that one's been around for quite a few years now. Yeah. But Russell wanted a refined one where there were actual photographs and you're doing the remote viewing like we were doing. Yeah, yeah. And so that's now there and it's called Stargate ESP. And Stargate ESP, that comes out of um, the original program that was funded at Stanford. And that's where these yeah. men were doing their psychic phenomena research into psychic spying and all mm. that. And uh, both those programs would help anyone that's interested in just learning about themselves yeah. and about how their psychic functions. Cause like when I do it, sometimes I see, oh, I hit red, but my mind kept saying blue, but I didn't do it. I didn't listen yeah, to yeah, my yeah, yeah. thought. And yeah. that's how it teaches you to discern between Absolutely. which is the information that's coming through that's really of the psychic nature or intuitive yeah. or which is the one that you're analytically saying. Yeah. So many, I, I, mean, I recommend time. it. The first one, um, I I have done that years ago when it first came out, because I was following Russell Targ and, mm -hmm. and Dean at the time and everything to do with sign. And I had an Apple phone, so I had um, I had the right, and I used to do that. And I remember um, the same thing happened. My mind would say either green and I'd go red. Why the fuck did I do that? Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I was like, I'd, and then I'd slam the phone down, and then I go, okay, do it again. Right, and then every so often, why did you do that? And the reason why I got the first, I haven't been able to, I've got a Samsung now, and I've told you last time, I've been unable to get it on there. But anyway, the reason um, I got that app, it wasn't just curiosity, because as you know, I a remote view and do all that but mine was you know this um sixth sense thing that i'd had as a child to perceive something danger before it comes a bit like your photograph but in my case it was the one and only mother um so i wanted to see you know at, at this age how strong was that so it was curiosity um but i spent most of my time going why did you second guess yourself <laughs> i got really frustrated you know and then i was raising children i had six kids and life and whatever but i found that app um really really good so if you've got the patience don't beat yourself up it really will help you um to understand i mean you'll be shocked actually you will actually be shocked at what you can do because everyone can do it so can we shift now? Because we'll be here to yes. tomorrow, me and you. Okay. So we got to the point um, when you're breastfeeding your last child. But, I mean, you've done all these experiments, which has opened you up and expanded your consciousness. Oh, my God, I can do this. I can do that. Where Do you recall where your headspace was? I mean, because we've all got dreams or you get married, you have families and quiz. I mean, that must have shifted your reality that, God, I can do all this. What well, you... what it did, like we talked about before, is it was giving me attention that I was so, so happy to be getting. Yeah. And also that I've never had a title that I'm a, you know, I, I haven't been a school teacher. I haven't been a, no, I, I don't I have, yeah. I don't have any title. No, you um, didn't. I've been a mother and I'm still a mother and I'll always yeah. be a mother. Yeah. And I've mothered more than just my own children. Yeah. So my life was at the time doing things to help other people, which I still continue to do. Yeah. And um, I had done a lot of traveling. I'd been, I'd had my time with my, my We Chol Indian friends. Yeah. I've had all sorts of, I've traveled around the world. I've been all around Asia. So I, 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 I've had was having exciting experiences when I would go to other places and then have psychic moments. Did, in the did you? Can I ask a question on that? Um, once you had that self realization about what was going on, who basically what you really were, so to speak, whatever you want to call it, did you find then that your life shifted or changed, your reality changed, and you attracted like minded people at that point, or? No, actually, wise. What, what it was, was, yes, I was out, I was doing a lot of retreats yeah. and I was doing things on the spiritual care of the living and dying. Yeah. I was see. I was not taking, because of the Werner experience, yeah. I never accepted anyone again as my guru person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was the best, like people, 
to me, he was the greatest lesson I could ever have yeah. because I didn't go and fall for any other nonsense after no, that. I, 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 somebody I, above I, me or they're better yeah, than yeah. me or any of this kind of thing. Instead, I would just go and really be, you know, impressed and amazed by the different peoples I was meeting. Yeah. I did do a lot of meditation. I did, and things that led me to that. When I had cancer, I ended up doing meditation and silent meditation for nine straight days, 12 hours a day with Joseph Goldstein, who was a very fine Vipassana meditation teacher and the founder of um, Insight Meditation, I think it's called in Barrie, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of, uh, I've done a lot of work on myself over the so years. A, a healing, yeah, the work on yourself. So there was, after that, was a healing period, a healing period. Like and you've been given the tools You'd recognize the tools and, and that, but now it was the healing time to work on yourself. Yeah, yeah. And I had um, a lot of different experiences that were enough psychic things to keep you busy, but I have never called myself a psychic. No. I never said, referred to myself as being psychic. Mm -hmm. I always feel like whenever these things happen, I never take it for granted. Mm -hmm. When all of a sudden I know something is happening or experiencing the death of someone I love dearly and my body's going through what they're going through mm -hmm. and they're thousands of miles away, it, 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 it's kind of a blessing and a curse mixed yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it was only till I was with Dean that I actually ever accepted the work, word that maybe I was psychic. Yeah. I've never, he said, I think I wrote him something and he said, just go eat a sandwich. You're very psychic, you know? <laughs> I know, it's it's amazing. I mean, I remember I was in my late 40s um, and obviously, you know, I'd seen dead people and everything else all the way through and all what you call psychic gifts. And I, I remember meeting, I made friends and they were mediums and white witches and anyway, got to talk to them and I was looking at them saying, you're weird. And they're going, why? I said, you talk to dead people, you're weird. And they went, oh, and you, you're psychic too. You do it. Too. I went, what? And they went, ding. I was like, oh, because it wasn't in my reality. I didn't infer. There was nothing around me that would infer you're this, you're that, or it was a gift. It was just like yourself. It was a natural, a different road to you, but it was a natural thing. And I don't know. And then I heard the word psychic. The yeah. only thing my father told me over and over again since I was a teenager he said is these are gifts yeah. and I, I i i believe just like when someone plays piano there's some that can sit down and they're playing Bach or whatever they're doing and playing at five years old they're playing yeah. beethoven yeah i mean that, that another person can't necessarily can't sit down at five years old and do what they did no, no. so uh so we would could call that word a gift yeah yeah so uh he said to me and I followed this through and I'm not saying this is for others, but this is for me. He said, never ever use your gifts for anything evil. Yes, I agree. Never ever use yeah. your gifts to harm or hurt another person. Yeah. Never yeah. use your gifts for any monetary gain. I, I totally and, agree on that one, yes. And that's for me, those are my yeah. biblical rules, you know what I mean? But yeah. it's not- I have the same, the same, the same rules, the same way. And there was once as a teenager, I mean, as a teenager, they were so heightened. And obviously I was experiencing a lot of trauma at the time. And and the one, and they'd put me on antipsychotic drugs because they said I was schizophrenic because I was seeing dead people. Um, anyway, and I remember some, a friend said something and I felt for the first time ever a rage. And it was just, I was being shown what I could do to her take go back and it went down and I it what what it taught me was how it could be used for the opposite and that was something that I innately can't do I can't do it it's like I, I wouldn't walk I wouldn't put my head in a gas oven I wouldn't put petrol and set myself on fire it's that I can't do it but I had to be shown that every um, being has a potentiality and a choice. And it's something to do with the individual. I don't know what that is, but I was shown that and I went, oh my God. And it wasn't a fear. It was maybe like a morale, a morale or ethical, I don't how, know. How old were you when they gave you these drugs? 
Um, 16, I was on, they put me on Fina, 15, 16. Fina Barberton said I was schizophrenic because I was seeing- I just want to say that, you know, of course, you know, no one has to believe this, but before coming on the show in the last hour, I was thinking about what we were going to talk about. Yeah. And for some reason, mm -hmm. I being put on drugs when I was 12. Yeah, there you up. go. And it's there exactly you your story. Same. But I want to, and I, and I got some in, you know, I, I was shedding a little light on what had happened, which was my parents were living in Central America on an island called Roatan, which back then was, you know, they didn't even have a vehicle. My dad brought the first vehicle to the island. Now it's the jet setting capital of the world for diving. But mm. back then it was just a, an island. Yeah, I mean, he missed it again. Again. And um, we, I was left to carry on on my own at 12. And I lived in a house where my grandparents lived downstairs. We lived upstairs and it was a separate life. And my dad left me with $7 a week mm. to live on for food and whatever I needed, which I have to say, even then was not a lot of money. <laughs> but anyways, uh, during that time, um, I was sort of, I was emotionally falling apart because all of a sudden my parents were gone and I was 12 and I was left to like this sort of thing. I was with my sister. So I was in a safe situation, but I felt like a lost soul because the, the parents were gone. So I was feeling, uh, I was having, I was going down a really not good path in my emotions. And my aunt suggested I go to this church organization and they interviewed me and said that I, they would definitely pay for me to have therapy. Oh. And when they sent me to therapy, it was because I explained that when they said, do you hear things? I said, of course I hear things. Yeah, you know, I said it. Yeah. Like, yeah. you see things? Of course I see yes, things. Of course, yes. I did not know that that was going to label me into no. this category of what you just said, schizophrenic. Schizophrenic. And they put me on a drug called uh, Stelazine. I don't know what that is. I don't drugs. Know. It's, it's in the family. Antipsychotic. Yes, it's the Antipsychotic. Yes. Yeah. And uh, Ritalin and Cogentin. And they were these three drugs. And mind you, I'm 12. I haven't had an aspirin yet. No, and all no, of a sudden, no, no. I'm being given this drug. And my parents don't know anything about yeah. me going to the therapy. I took it for five days mm -hmm. because they had threatened me that if I was going to keep telling them if I, that I was seeing things, mm -hmm. they would have to put me into an institution. Yeah, yeah. And if I take these drugs, then I don't have to be institutionalized because yeah. then I'm going to be fine. Yeah. Yeah, I took the drugs. I lost all connection to everything. In was, five days, I became like a numb person, yeah. and I had no emotional reaction. I wasn't happy. I wasn't sad. Right. I wasn't like the walking. I found I was the Walking Dead. Yeah, uh, and it, and people are living like this. It's yes. really sad. Yeah. Yeah. But I had the the mind and the where to all to know that this was not what I wanted in my body, yeah. especially after my upbringing. Same I stopped there after five days and I would just pour them, you know, it was New York City, I'd pour them down the toilet bowl and I would just go to the therapy because I liked the talking and having yeah. someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, oh yes, I take those pills. Oh yes. I did, that's what I did. I yeah, I've taken them. Them. yeah, yeah, and I didn't. I took myself off because I mean, it was, and you know, I had an awareness and understanding that it was having this psychic, at that point it was really heightened and a tuned in psychic gift. Um, and the drugs coming in together, it was just sent me loopy, as well as sleeping a lot, no oh, feeling, yeah. no nothing. And I think that's why that experience come. And because all of a sudden from nowhere come this feeling of anger. Now, I'd never had anger as a child. I never had, it wasn't there. And I was like shocked and I was going to harm. Well, before it was like, they were showing me you could harm her. Yeah. And I was seeing an act as I was going towards, I don't know what I was going to do. And I went boom and that did it. And that did it for me. And I had the, that's when I had the realization you also cannot use it. It is so powerful that you cannot use it to harm another or to benefit yourself. Now, if I had carried out that act, it would have been to benefit, to make me feel better because the drugs, were, you know, but I learned straight away, I can't take these drugs, it's affecting who I am. Didn't know who the hell I was, 
I didn't know what gifts I had, but I knew I could do things. But trust me, I shut my mouth and never spoke of dead people and all the experiences that I, I stopped. I knew that, I learned, yeah. And this is the sad part is like, you and I were able to take ourselves out of that yeah. terrible cycle that they were trying to put us in to be drug Many monitored. Times. But there are many that have not. And, and, and I'm sure, you know, there are some people who they really need to be kept on certain drugs to keep them from hurting themselves yeah. or hurting others. You know, yeah. there are seriously people that do have severe mental illness. Yeah. But that has nothing to do with people that are actually seeing and hearing things. No, it's, it's because it's, science is seeing them. I, they agree. Real. I mean, my, my elder brother, um, he was di diagnosed with schizophrenia too. Um, because he actually, um, I was seeing the dead people, but he come and told me he was seeing these ETs and they were giving them this scientific information. And, he, and I used to think he was crazy because I just saw dead people, un unaware that I was also seeing them. It was in the family. Um, and he, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He wasn't understood. Um, he didn't have a mental health until they gave him the drugs and diagnosis, yeah? Um, and that it just destroyed him. And then he turned to um, illegal drugs to try and block everything out until eventually he died taking, um, it was, it was uh, glue, I think, I don't know, at mm. 42, 43. He couldn't exist anymore because the drugs and no one being there, um, he just got lost in that, which was a shame. However, I agree with you. Um, there's not enough awareness this is why these podcasts and conversations are very are so important because someone might be sitting home with their own child right now. Who's going and thinking, through it. Yeah. Maybe I should be giving them something else. Maybe I should be bringing them to somebody who can help heal with them. Yeah. Not somebody that's going to put them on drugs and numb I mean, them. You know, um, one, of my, uh, my, my, one of my children um, who's very psychic, he, he is, I mean, really and spiritual he's um um he's diagnosed with adhd and all he's got autism as well um and they tried when he was diagnosed at five they said we want to put him on is it ritalin and all that. i said no 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 and and i worked with him and with therapy i worked with him and you know um i would wouldn't allow that and uh because I, I'd been, I, I was aware that he had um, genetically the same as I. I knew it, you know, they all have, but him especially. And I refused. I said no. And I, um, well, then therapy. Yep, yeah, let's do therapy. This and is it, also an important thing for the listeners to know is that often, first of all, I believe the same as you, that everyone has abilities that they can be telepathic they can yeah. be clairvoyant yeah. they can see these things and most everyone does have that experience often when they lose a loved one there are, there are moments in the life that brings it yeah. it's just that some other people like you and i it's a thread that runs through our life continually yeah. Yeah. other people have the access to it it's just a matter of can they listen to their inner voice because yeah. we start shutting it down as we're taught in school and religion and other things to not listen to that inner voice or the higher self or your angel or yeah, whatever yeah. the word is for yeah. it. And the more we listen, the more this, the, the voice becomes stronger. Yeah. So it's important for uh, listeners to know that that's all available to them. This is not something that they don't have access to. Today, it's, there's matter. so many avenues. Back in, in our day, there, there wasn't very any avenues. If Well, in my case, there was none. Hence why, obviously, there was an attempt at suicide, because it was just too much in the end for everything. However, um, I'm still here. I'm not dead, and you are not a medium at this point. Um, <laughs> wouldn't that be weird? I could be <laughs> a medium. Hey, no, stop it, stop it. We're digressing. But it, today, that there, there are there are places you can go. There are telephone numbers you can call. Oh, the Rhine Research Center in Durham, North Carolina. Here. This is the oldest parapsychology uh, education place. And now they're because of uh, everything being, uh, because of COVID and everything being shut down as far as large conferences and things like this. In one way, it's very wonderful that people who could not go to those conferences mm -hmm. can now be attending online. Yes. And people can go online and see things yeah. that they can 
they can speak to or be yes. participating yes. in question and answers. Mm. There's a lot of information out there, but I, the Ryan Research Center is, they have an education program and then they show uh, videos. There's a, a whole library there of videos where you can see people speaking that were there, including myself. Yeah. And um, it's a wonderful knowing that people aren't lost out there where there's nobody to talk to. Or yeah, no I do think, since, I mean, you know, um, everything's went online with the lockdown, um, which I think was so beneficial because many people couldn't even afford to travel. Yeah? Right. Couldn't even afford to travel or were too scared due to their what they were going through to go and face to face somebody. Yeah. And and because I know I found with the groups that I run um, on Zoom and, and over the year, um, you know, many people come in and they're quiet and whatever. Then after a while, they feel they're in a safe space. It's given them an access to something they never had access to before. So the lockdown was a blessing in many different ways, but definitely for those um, I say children of the paranormal, especially because <laughs> we were children of the paranormal. Um, and, the, and I've encountered many children of the paranormal through my career. So there are accesses out there for you. However, we are going to have to jump because we've already hit the hour. We're not, yes. we're going to overtime, but we always do this. I don't mind. We can go into overtime. So I don't even know where we were. Where were we? Oh, we oh. were. I asked you the question. Oh, how I think about what was it like now after all these years yeah, of doing yeah, this yeah, yeah. sort of stuff yeah. is that, which I always say every time, if I'm driving down the road and all of a sudden I get a feeling that, uh-oh, there's going to be an accident and yeah. I swerve out of the way and I don't, and then the accident happens and I miss it, I it doesn't matter whether it was 50 years ago or now, I still get an excited jump inside my stomach of like, oh, I knew that, I saw that, and it just happened. Yeah. Wow. I never take it for granted. I never think that it's something that will always be an access to me at any time. It, or it, any it, it comes up, doesn't it, when it's needed. I even have it like when I'm about, because I live in a village now, um, when I'm about to go out, step out, because I need to go out in the other world, so to speak, um, I sit there and it's like I got, I wait very patiently. They go, now, it's now. And I know if I'm walking in the town, I'm going somewhere, it's like, don't go left, go right. It's, it's, it's all, it, not all the time, but it's still there. Um, or the person will come to my mind, oh, I'm going to meet them today. Vroom, round the corner, here they come. So I know sort of what mask to put on, how to be, because that, it, you know, that's sort of, it could be more, most. But it's, it's, for me, it's sort of, I don't want to say like a roller coaster, mm -hmm. but it's sort of something that I have peaks and ups yes, and downs. It with. goes up and there down. Like moments, that. I call it, I call it being hot. I don't mean, yeah, being yeah, yeah. Yeah. but I mean being yeah. hot. I go like this, wow, you did it again. You still got it, old girl. You know I mean? <laughs> it's, it's honest, because as a child, it was 24-7. But I go, yeah, you know, I just thought of you. Yeah, and I'm like a kid, you know, when it happens. I haven't lost it yet. But so uh, I don't know where we went after that. Look, we've done it again, Gail. Come on. We need to well, be. Where were let's we? See. I, I don't know where we're talking. I guess we're rounding down here, but I don't know we where we're going to round down because we're just going to. More like I'm talking to a girlfriend having a social conversation. I mean, just, <laughs> we do it all the time. So, right. Um, that shit, I, something about, you know, you've gone to, you've done Dean um, Raiding, that you went off, um, you started your spiritual aspect was coming in. You were doing the work on yourself, the healing, which was needed. So, we've gone past that. Where are we now? So we are now at a place where my children are all grown and don't live in my home anymore, but they live on my property or nearby. Yeah. Um, I busy myself with taking care of foods and things that are, are, are growing all over here. I'm constantly processing or drawing yes. or panning or making jelly or something. And um, I... I have found that I was finally given a title now. I have a, a hat to wear. Yes, you I, do. I was initiated as a Mongolian shaman in 2011. So it's been 10 years now. 
Yeah. And um, I find that I do some very wonderful combination medium healing. I'm not yeah. sure what words you want to use yeah. when somebody's, I don't make, I don't sell anything, but I have when family or friends or someone passing through feels a need to have a shamanic sort of a blessing or healing, or yeah. I don't know what the words are. Yeah. Um, I find that I can be of uh, assistance in that. Yeah. And I wear all my amazing shamanic clothing that I was initiated in. That's all the protective gear I need when I'm doing that kind of work. Yeah. And um, I'm finding that I never knew until September that podcasts is a way for me to reach people. Oh, and that's, yes. I mean, they really like me out there. And I'm, yes. really, I, I was on one show that in three days had 20,000 views. Yeah. <laughs> I was just imagining who would want to lose 20,000. I mean, I just can't even imagine it, yeah. but it makes me feel good when I see the comments yeah. that people are saying, I had just that same experience. I know that story. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. I hope to hear more things. I also like the feeling of the intimacy that, you know, I'll be dead, whether it's tomorrow or 10 years or whenever it is that I'm going to be dead all these stories now are in a place that if I ever have grandchildren or any of my children ever miss me, they yeah, can they actually just can click on it, right? I'm and telling you. Say, oh, there she is doing that again, you know? It's a case, and I feel the same. And, and for many years prior to me starting Open Minds January at the beginning of the year, and then the podcast coming in um, afterwards, and um, uh, every, it, it, no matter where I went, if I went to a medium, whatever happened, or I was narrating something, I was told you should write a book. And I said, I am so not writing a book. I'm so not writing a book. And all the experiences, and I would share the paranormal, ET, contact. And I said, I am not, I'm not here to write a book. Anyway, long story short, um, through the, now I'm this host on podcasts and, and open minds, um, I, did, I had this realization. And again, one of my guests said to me, you know, you really should write a book. And it just came in. I said, I am the book. I'm an oral book, an oral book and a video book. And that's what you are now. I'm a, I'm, I am the book. And you're the book. I'm a, I, I did write a 350 page book called Small, Medium at Large. Yeah, you did. But I have I could self-publish it, but I haven't. I was just hoping a publisher might do that someday. But it's 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 be it was my reason for starting this podcast. Yes. And now it doesn't matter to me at all. No. Because what matters to me is the connection with people. And that's Absolutely. what I made. When someone from Norway says, I love listening to you. I, I you know, if you ever come to Norway, come and stop in. Yeah. I couldn't be more thrilled. Yeah. England, I I have a couple of friends in England now. I mean, I feel like yeah. if ever the time comes that I'll be traveling the world again. You're coming I'll to my village in the UK. You're yes. in my village, love. And we'll get our broomsticks out and we'll be off. I'll be, I'll be ghost hunting in Massachusetts or Rhode Island with the friends I met. I mean. <laughs> the podcast, the podcast, um, I never saw, I know you didn't either. You know, with the life experiences, and we're only a few years apart, um, never saw... I, I was never wanted to speak in public. I, I, you know, even though I was, a, I was a sassy, you know, in your face comedian. That's just who I am. Um, never dreamed. I had a body dysmorphia. I hated photographs of myself. And then, for fudge's sake, I go and start open minds. And I'm, not, and the, when I first started open minds, it was live. I'm like, oh my god, who did this? And then it just, and. No, I never thought I'd do it. But however, I have met some of the most beautiful souls. I have found what we call new friends. Or no, I'm going to say I've reconnected. Mm -hmm. I've reconnected with beings that I'm so familiar with. I have my ideas what, who they are and how, but I'm so familiar and I resonate. And I love hearing, you must feel the same. I love hearing the individual journey, the human experience. I love it's how it's community. It's a community. We're finding this yeah. community. Yeah. And it's it, and it's a very supportive yeah. and validating experience. Yeah. And I'm really grateful for it. Oh, God. And yeah. It, 
it also attaches to teach you that occasionally there's going to be these things, I guess they call them a troll. Yeah. And you get some kind of weird, nasty comment. And when I got the first weird, nasty comment, I was like, oh, I'm not going to do another podcast again, you know? <laughs> you know what, do you know what I do? Um, you just delete them. This like the fly. Well, when I mentioned it, the person who had me on their show said, oh, we get those all the time. I'm yeah, deleting. Yeah, just delete them. Like like okay. Fly, you know? um, but you, and I always think, you know, they've obviously listened and it's obviously they're resisting. So it's, it's awakened something in them. So they're going to come in abusive. I just will delete it. I, I mean, I don't even respond or react, but they've listened at some point down the line. It's going to come that's back right. and they're going to attract more and they're going to keep resisting. And that's how it happens. So even them, I say, whoop, you're going to wake up one day. <laughs> Love and light. I, I like that idea. I'm going to think of that if I ever see yeah. another one. <laughs> another one, just say, oh, I've affected you. You know, yeah, I don't really say love and light. I just say, enjoy your journey. It's your free choice. And mm -hmm. I don't have a judgment or an effect with it. But I know they're going to, because I recall me back in the day, you know, when you listen to your, you know, somebody and you're like this, oh, you bastard, that's not true, it's not my belief. And you, you're like, you want to like, Ugh. and you go away, but then you calm well, down. No, and simple things like, yeah. I didn't believe in spoon bending, but no, I heard no. about it. No. And, and you know, here's, here's, here's my fork. Here's your fork. Right there, that that you around yeah. twice yeah. in a very unusual, yeah. you know, Positioning. You can't, you, you can't get, I mean, come on, I've got to have one better than you. I was a medium talking to dead people rather for most of my life until about, I never knew who I was. And, you know, I'm telling mediums, you're weird. You talk to dead people. And I was one of them. I mean, you can't get weirder than that. I was so shut off from society and community, literally for 42 years. Um, I had no comprehension while well, you out there swinging it with Dean and that. And then, you know, I was just so new. This world out here was so new to me. I only knew how to come into it with this gift, which obviously wasn't really accepted from the get go. And I find why I'm raising this is we are a polarity of each other. You came in with the loving parents and all the support all the way through. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no loving parents? I, not. <laughs> I came in from two car thieves that were stealing cars in Manhattan that my father, in fact, this is the reason I believe, and I think maybe we'll have to end, but the reason I think that I was opened up so much psychically is because I was lied to about who my mother was. Uh, oh, and yes. So, yes. Yes, yes. So I was taken from the hospital in a shoebox. Yes, that's given, it. Given to my father's wife, who was not happy to have a third child dropped on them to take care of when she couldn't take care of the two that she'd given birth yeah, to. It. Yeah. And so it was actually a very uh, emotionally and physically abusive childhood yeah. that I grew up in. A bit like mine. And, uh, yeah. But I always... You know, I always, I, I always look for the the better and the good about whatever came from it, and so to me, it makes me who I am today as yeah. somebody with compassion and understanding, yeah. because I endured a lot of bizarre, abusive, yeah. physical and mental pain. You know, the, before we close, I mean, I I spoke to others about this, and I still don't quite understand it. And even as a child, with all you know, you're aware of what happened to me. Um, I always had this love. And all the way through, and no matter what, I always had this love. And it never went anywhere, no matter what I experienced that the human would call evil. Um, it was just love. There wasn't even a revenge. There was, and exactly then- Exactly how I feel. I've never felt hatred or anger, no. not even mm -hmm. anger about what they did. Yeah. I just said what you did would normally make somebody else a complete, they would never be able to function in the world. No. I said, but I was able to, to ride above all that. And I think part of it is what we began with in the beginning, mm -hmm. laughter. Yeah. Laughter has taken me through all of these things you and it's a know. healing property and it's yeah. a good, it's a wonderful thing to share. I think it is. And on that note, we haven't covered even a third of this woman. We're, we're going to bring her back. She's on Inception podcast as well. There's another one coming out. I'll get her back again. Um, oh. and we'll go, 
we'll go on to a specialist topic. Yes, darling. Yes, I just want to add one more thing in case people are actually interested in reading anything. Yeah. If they go to gailhyson.medium.com, mm -hmm. it's a site where people publish their stories. Mm -hmm. There's 10 different stories there that are of all different, all different styles. So if they want to read about, you know, psychic things and other things, they'll find it in those stories I've written. And on the advertisement on the F FB page, I've got all your links up there as well. So just go on right. to Open Minds chat page. Um, the links are on there now at the moment. And you can follow Gail, look for anything she's doing, investigate more, um, just get hold of her, whatever you need to do. Um, there was something else I was going to say. I can't recall what it was. It's totally it's fog brain again now. Gail, it's been absolutely amazing. And I knew it would be. It's been laughter. We digress off topic as we normally do, but it was really relevant digression, especially when we spoke about the mental health aspect of journeys like we've experienced. And I hope for the audience, if you can resonate with anything we said, um, we hope we hope you made you laugh because we make each other laugh. It's just like <laughs> looking in the mirror, talking to her. Um, um, you know, take it with you. If it doesn't quite resonate with you and we pressed your buttons like we spoke about, ask yourself, why have we pressed your buttons? What, what are you resisting? What is it you don't, that's not resonant? You don't have to agree. You've got free will, free choice. But, you know, a bit of discernment sometimes. I had to learn that when everyone pressed my buttons, when I was opening up to my ways right this way. And I'm like you, no gurus. Thank you very much. And in the end, I realized I'm the best guru for me, not for anyone else. I'm, I'm the best guru for me. Go find your own guru and I won't be your guru. So um, please, I, I hope we've helped in some way. Gail, thank you so much, sweetie. Until the next time we try and have another conversation, because um, we can't follow a script, that's quite blatantly obvious. Um, but we did good. And thank you for sharing part of your wonderful life experience. And to everyone that's watched Open Minds and supporting and liking and subscribing, please do. It's not about me. It's not about how many likes I get. It's about sharing the information my guests are bringing. And it's free for you. So please like, subscribe and share out there. Until the next time, next Sunday. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye.